that's working. Um, so yeah, I um, I haven't been here before, but I've uh, watched a lot of the videos, and I think this might be the first time ever there's been no lines of code on this, on the screen for the whole night. So um, if you all want to leave now, you can. Um, so um, ah, sorry, yeah. Um, so uh, hands up anyone here who works in a startup. Okay, and hands up anyone here who's only ever worked in a startup. Okay, so most of us here have worked in established businesses that are up and running. But I, I suppose some, something, I suppose what prompted this talk was, I suppose you, you go to the web summit, you look at TechCrunch, and what you see is lots and lots of talk about startups. Mo that's not where most of us work. That's where some of the innovation is taking place, but that's not where most of us work. So I just wanted to kind of talk about some of the, what's different in, in one versus the other. So just, I suppose, just a little bit of in, uh, about me, I suppose, my background. So. Uh, age 13, uh, uh, second-hand Spectrum ZX came into the house, uh, no tape drive, couldn't load up any games, so I started coding away, tried to uh, get some games up and running, um, but uh, because there was no tape drive, couldn't save them, so uh, as soon as mum wanted to hoover my room and plugged out the computer, that was the end of the games, but uh, the, the, I had to live with that. Um, uh, moved on, got into a bit of animation and multimedia stuff, ended up going to art college, um, then moved away from tech completely for a few years until the mid to late 90s and got into web design, action script, JavaScript. Um, and was working doing web design and coding for a few years. Um, but got a bit frustrated with web design itself, web design opportunities here in Cork at that stage where I was working on things like <laughs> bed and breakfasts and stuff like that and it wasn't the most imaginative work in the world. So I uh, started to get more into the UX side of things and the business side of things as well. So. I uh, went on to manage a few websites for Water for Crystal, selling some nice crystal and fairly cheesy paddywhackery stuff into the American market. Uh, they loved it in America, uh, but then Water for Crystal went wallop. Um, so then I moved on to uh, Super Value, part of Musgrave, to help them set up their online grocery service um, and discovered as well that they had lots of digital potential um, outside of the online uh, grocery model that we'd gone in to set up uh, that they weren't yet tapping into. So um, I'll go into some of that in more detail in a while. Um, from there, I moved on to Lay Healthcare to get their uh, digital program up and running, and uh, it was very different actually than Super Value. So Super Value was literally about moving tins of beans from one place to another. Insurance is actually a virtual product, so it's quite different, and they, they actually had a good level of uh, digital activity up and running. Um, so before I get into the detail of some of the things uh, that I worked on, um, and, and that's what I'm going to go through, is just some of the stuff I worked on. Actually, it was interesting, uh, Oliver Moran, who uh, organizes some of this stuff here, asked me to speak, and he, he said, uh, I'm really stuck for someone to speak, uh, so will you. So uh, I, I was flattered, of course. Um, so um, I, I thought it was interesting like that all the businesses I've worked in have been established businesses, started in Monster, very successful, had big IT teams, but yet when you see the lineups at the conferences and stuff, it's all about the startups. And I, I suppose I'm I was just kind of wondering if, there's, if it's worth kind of exploring about how we can be more innovative in existing businesses and what the differences are and why it's so fascinating, uh, why people are so fascinated with startups. Um, so um, I suppose some of the key differences, I suppose, between a startup and an established business, and um, I suppose established businesses have established revenue streams, and that's, that's a huge advantage. It means you can support any new innovation. So when you come up with new initiatives to do, you have revenue there to support it. Um, but it also brings huge challenges because uh, you have an established revenue stream, but that means all of the focus of the business is going to be on that side. So as soon as you're trying to pull people away from that and get them involved in something new, you have a huge challenge there. Um, I suppose it does mean that new initiatives can be supported for longer, but even that in itself, actually, things can be left drag on. It can be a little bit of a double-edged sword because you actually get things that, in a startup world where there's limited funding, they'd be killed off really quickly, and you've got that fast-fail fast fail thing. And I know that's a bit of a buzzword, but it, it's true, too. Things can be left limp along, and there's, there's often no point, and they're going nowhere. People get disillusioned, people leave. Whereas, actually, if you can just cut things off more quickly, actually, it's, it, it, it's a real innovation driver. Um, established businesses have, have long established processes and ways of working, and change is really hard. Um, so like uh, when, when things get tough, everyone always reverts to form. So, 
where you've got a business that's been running for a good long period of time and you're, you've introduced something new, you've got it off the ground and then there's some kind of a hiccup, something happens with the business, recession strikes, something happens, people will always revert to what they know. So they'll go back to answering phones, sending out stuff in the mail, they'll always revert back to what they know. So I think that can be a really, really big challenge. Um, but what established businesses do have is they have a customer base, which I know is part of the revenue thing, but it's actually much more than a revenue thing. It's actually, the, it's the customer data is, is the crucial piece there. So when you're trying to do new innovative things, you've got something you can base your estimation on. You've something that you, you've customers you can message. You've something you can do tests on as well. You can, you can have a control group and a test group. You can try things out. And that's a huge advantage that, that businesses that have an established customer base have. Um, but then you have the challenge of when you try something new, you have to bring those customers on a journey with you. So that can be quite hard. So, um, and then established businesses have legacy systems. So legacy systems, everybody's dealt with them. And you're never going to replace all the legacy systems in a place just because you've got some big brainwave that you want to uh, introduce. So you're just going to have to find ways to work. <laughs> with them, over them, through them, whatever. Um, so I, I thought I'd go through some examples of things I've worked on and some lessons I've learned along the way around what works in terms of digital strategies. And, and um, maybe some of you might find it interesting. We'll see. Um, as I mentioned, I work for Waterford Crystal uh, in a Cork-based subsidiary. The main lesson I learned there in digital was it is often not the big, new, shiny thing that actually works, that generates money. Um, and that customer data is everything. That division of Waterford Crystal was actually based in Cork. It was a, an old paper cataloging business that grew, grew, uh, grew a web presence as well. Uh, but because they came out of the kind of cataloging business, they had a huge amount of data on their customers. All of these customers all over the US bought regularly. So they buy for Christmas or they buy for their birthday and they were buying this, these Irish products regularly. So we, we knew what they were doing. So we were able to do quite a lot of personalized stuff. And it was actually email that worked there in that instance. It was just a few years ago. Um, but with some basic personalization and testing, we were able to grow the revenues of, the, of that business substantially. Unfortunately, the rest of Waterford dragged it down and that was that. So time to move on. So, um, so when I moved on to Musgrave, uh, working on the Super Value Online Shopping uh, service, great service, um, John here as well tonight. Um, uh, I found myself, uh, I was waiting a decision actually on whether or not the, we, the project was going to go ahead. And so I had to start looking around to see, well, <coughs> what else can we do here digitally? And what we found actually was that there was, there was loads we could do because you've got, with grocery shopping, you've got special offers come out every week. You've got people basically shop on a weekly cycle. Um, we knew what they were buying because we had a, a rewards card. So we, were, we had a huge amount of data. And what we were proposing was that we would start to contact these customers more regularly with special offers by email and by text. And that we would gradually build a personalization model and that then we would be able to send out uh, vouchers to them that were personalized to them that were based on certain products. But actually, what we, what we hit fairly quickly was a lot of resistance. So is it right to uh, contact our customers more regularly? Will customers be OK with it? Are we going to scare them off? And it, it was actually it was the first real introduction I had in terms of that kind of uh, layers of corporate governance thing, where you're actually trying to get an idea across that you know it's going to work. And it did work, and it did produce revenue. But it took quite a while for us to kind of uh, get, that, get that through. Um, so it, it seemed relatively simple, but the hurdles that we had to jump were, were, were really hard. But bit by bit, result by result, we managed to convince them that it was a huge revenue potential. And I think that was a key learning that being able to get a small result and then being able to get some data to convince people that to, to go ahead with something was, was, a, real, was a real big win. Um, but the important advantage we had was that we had customers. We had data that we were able to work with. Um, a bit of emailing and texting is not a digital strategy. That's just one campaign. But uh, we realized pretty early that if we were going to get customers to engage with SuperValue and change their shopping behavior, that it, we had to do more than just talk about special offers. So grocery shopping is all about food. So we had to develop a load of content around recipes and work with you know, celebrity chefs and stuff like that, do Facebook chats with nutritionists and stuff like that. And I suppose with digi any digital strategy, it's really important that you can do little 
things, but it's actually when they all come together that it really starts to work. When you're doing, you know, so we had the online grocery shopping up and running. We were sending regular emails and texts. Uh, we had loads more people checking into the site for recipes and then going on to buy those items online. But at that stage, we realized we were missing a trick. People had the laptop open in, in, in the sitting room. They had the presses open in the kitchen. They were running backwards and forwards to add things to their list. So obviously, mobile was the piece we were missing so that they could actually add the items while they were rummaging through the fridge looking to see whether they had lettuce or cabbage or whatever. Um, at that stage, you know, we, we had a real challenge around, you know, was it going to be mobile web, was it going to be an app, and, you know, uh, it was budget and legacy platforms actually that kind of helped us figure out what to do because we had limited budget and legacy platforms dictated that responsive web wasn't going to work for us at that stage. Um, and, and we developed an app and it worked really well for, for, the, for the business at that stage. But I suppose overall in SuperValue, the biggest thing that we had to do was eliminate doubt. So is contacting the customers the right thing to do? Uh, is there a right special offer for a customer? Is the store open when they want to go shopping? Is our, our customers actually, actually going to use the online shopping? And then for the customer themselves, when they're online, there, I think that really gets magnified, and you know, if you can eliminate any doubts they have, like you know, do I want to shop here? Is this secure? Does anyone else use this? Am I getting good value? Is there anything, you know, that that I'm forgetting to get that I normally buy? So all the time you're trying to make sure you can eliminate any doubt that that people have in their minds. You know, is the price right? Is the quality right? Is the service as good online as it is in the stores? So when I moved on then to Leia Healthcare, uh, the first project that we looked at was how we could sell health insurance more simply. So again, you get the doubts coming in again. So health insurance, that's an emotional purchase. It's, it's not something people will regularly want to buy online because you know, it's the health of their family and all that kind of stuff. And it's really complex, there's hundreds of products. How are you gonna decide what level of cover you need? So again, I suppose what we had to do was <laughs> bite off little chunks and try and eliminate those, those doubts that people had. So uh, we worked really hard to, uh, to see how we could ensure that people could easily see the price of the product, see what that would change if they, if they changed the price, what does that do to the benefits, what does that do to everything. But we started off in small chunks and uh, I think Oliver Moran gave a talk here uh, before about some of the testing that they did um, on, on the UX side of things and we did a huge amount of usability testing. And that really helped us to convince the senior management team, the board members, that you know, these projects and more of these projects were the right things for us to be doing. So we develop a small prototype, bring that out to the local Costa Coffee, ask people to take a look at it, bring the videos of that back to the, back to the, the, the board and show them that this, this stuff is actually working. People are well able to use this. People are engaging with it. And then what we were able to do was we were able to get this stuff live and show the results. And once you can start to show even small results, you start to get the trust. And once you're building the trust, you're on, you're on the right journey. Um, I suppose in terms of eliminating the doubt of our customers about where they're getting the right product and stuff, stuff like web chat and stuff really helped in that sense. We were, you know, you're not going to be able to do it all there. So if you can just, without taking them away from that online journey, I think that, that really helps. But that was just one aspect of the business. Leia sells insurance. And we, we'd, I suppose, had a huge success there in improving the sales <laughs> process. But the main, the other, one of the main other interactions people have with their health insurer is, is making small claims for going to the GP or whatever. Um, and I, I don't know if, if, uh, if many of you had, have, have had the experience of trying to make a claim with your health insurance for going to the GP, but up until 12 months ago, all, the way, there's four health insurers in Ireland, and the way they all work is you keep your paper receipts, you gather them up when you have enough of them, or maybe once a year, you put them in an envelope. You send that envelope to, to your healthcare provider. Someone in there assesses the paper uh, receipts. If there's a problem with one of the receipts, they send you a letter back with detailing the nature of the problem. Then you sort out the problem and send a letter back to them, and then they assess it. And if everything is okay, they'll send you a check back in the post, which is, and this is what all of them are doing, absolutely archaic. So we developed a really simple app take a picture on your phone of the receipts, whiz it through to us, we'll assess it, we'll do an EFT transfer, and we'll pay you within two days. So it was really simple, really really quick to develop, but actually the difference it made was amazing. And like within a, within a year, over 60% of the claims we were getting were coming through that, that, uh, that app. So that was a huge result. 
I suppose now we're looking at how we can simplify the other interactions we have with our members. So, um, you know, the whole members area uh, uh, piece is, is huge. So people call us all the time to do stuff and they all call us on the phone. So I suppose we're trying to see, well, people don't want to call us on the phone, they have to call us on the phone. So how can we change that? Um, so we're working on that, all that. And like, all this is, it's fairly standard stuff, you know, like the banks have solved this years ago, but actually if you look all across the insurance, insurance industry, and particularly the healthcare insurance industry, this stuff is not being done well at all. And, you know, we, we're changing and it's really working for Leia. But actually what's really working is, is, is the more of this stuff we do, the more it kind of lifts each other. So each of the different projects we do actually kind of, people get used to, if they bought online, they want to be serviced online. And if the service is there online, they'll, they'll use it. And it, it kind of, it all works together. Um, so that's a bit of what I've worked on. I've skipped through the slides, so I wasn't too, uh, <laughs> too, too sure about uh, use, whether, whether I'd uh, use all the slides. Um, I suppose I wanted to go through some of the, the challenges that I've seen uh, working in kind of large traditional, uh, well, medium-sized traditional businesses. Um, I suppose the first one is about senior management buy-in. That's absolutely crucial. And it, it can often require a lot of perseverance. So if you're working in a, in a whatever kind of like a, a standalone tech business, this is obviously quite different. But if, different. But if you're in a more traditional <laughs> business that has that you're trying to push the whole uh, digital agenda in, real perseverance is required. You, you're going to hear no all the time, and you have to keep, keep trying, and you have to keep, keep trying to find ways to get a project across. You've got to be able to articulate your point and back it up with data. You've got to be able to find the benefit, not just for the business, because you're going to have, if you've got a project you're trying to put, put it across, you're going to know what the main benefits are for the business. But if you are trying to convince someone, you've got to be able to point out to them what the businesses are, or what the benefits are. Um, you've also got to be able to take a high level view of the business and see kind of holistically what the business needs to be doing digitally. But you've also got to be able to have conversations about, you know, table design or te technological approach, whether it's, you know, responsive or whatever your, what the, 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 the conversation of the day is. Um, legacy systems we've already spoken about. Um, in terms of sign off, one of the things that you tend to encounter is, um, you think you've got a project signed off and then you discover there's another layer of the onion. There's another layer of bureaucracy you need to get through. You need to talk to the accountants or you need to talk to another, the board, it needs to go up to the board or it needs to go somewhere. And I suppose you just need to be prepared for that kind of shifting goalposts and you need to have the data ready all the time to be able to convince everyone that a project needs to happen. A, a big challenge with a lot of projects as well is uh, attribution. So if you're trying to get a project up and running, and you get the project up and running, and you think you've had really big success, and you go up and you say, hey, we've grown sales by 20%, and then someone else says, no, no, the, the pricing guys are saying that that's because they reduced the price by 5%. Um, trying to attribute where the benefits are coming from is hugely important on any project. And um, th that's, that's something, if you can have that mapped out before you start a project, how am I going to prove, if these are the benefits we think we're going to get, how am I going to prove that this got those benefits, not something else got those benefits? And that's, that's a, a hard thing to do. Uh, and I have to say, it's not something I've completely cracked. Um, so I suppose if, if you're in a startup, you've got lots of freedom, you probably don't have legacy systems, you have minimal layers of governance, there's a real drive for change there. But you've all sorts of challenges as well. You've got, you know, no customer data potentially or very limited. You've no real customer base and maybe not very reliable revenue. But I think uh, the key is to, to know the challenges of whatever you're in and just enjoy it really. That's it. So that's it. <laughs> Any questions or? I have a question, you probably already had this situation many times. How do you deal with, let's say, company have an established system and you know that it could be really improved, but the, every time they say, oh, it's good enough. Yeah, and, 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 that's, and that's, that's my job. That's, that's what I, I do every day at the moment is, okay. it, it, and, and the answer really is, is I think, is, is data. So to try and, 
try and find a way to prove that you're right, that it can make a change, and to try and map out and estimate what the benefits would be. So it, if there's no benefit for them, in, you know, everything can be better. But often, good enough is good enough. And you need to prove to them that if it was better, there would be a real tangible benefit to them. And if there isn't, then why would they make it better? Just because it can be better isn't often a good enough reason. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, so, so I think it's to prove that there's real, real benefits there is, is, I think, the key. Oh, OK. Thank you. Is there a big uptake among businesses in getting a digital strategy? Because I'm just thinking, like, you know, abandon flooding there over Christmas. I mean, if those businesses had a kind of digital strategy in place, they wouldn't be, you know, such a difficult situation. Yeah, no, I, like, there is, and certainly in larger and medium businesses, there is. Yeah. In smaller businesses, I know the likes of Enterprise Ireland are trying to get more businesses online and, yeah. and get more businesses to, to, to be trading online. I mean, like, the answer is yes, there's a huge appetite to, to, to grow this. I mean, if you look at, if you follow any of the stuff on LinkedIn and stuff like that, you can see like Chief Di Digital Officer is one of the real hot kind of roles out there at yeah. the moment. So they're, they're all trying to figure out how do I crack this? And that's certainly in the larger, larger businesses. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the shops down in Bandon, that's on a smaller scale. And it's, it, it, it's a tougher nut to crack in many ways <coughs> because when you have scale, it's easier to do to do digital, and, and it's easier to do these initiatives. But at the same time, there's lots of tools out. There's lots of free tools. There's yeah. lots of, you know, relatively cost-effective tools that you can use that can get you online relatively, at basically no cost. Especially yeah. if you're on a small number of transactions. You know, there's there's free trials for nearly everything. So absolutely, yeah. I mean. <coughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, would you have any tips for, say, you're an outside, a small, smaller entity, and say, true expertise in, say, a health type product, of introducing that into a company, say, as big as Leia, is it something that would uh, be a benefit for them, uh, provably so, showing their goodwill, show how they're interested in, and, you know, health, certain health issues, and it's something quite simple. So, tips for being able to do that? I, I mean, I suppose. Talk to me afterwards is probably the is probably the, the, the best way. I mean, like there's they're if they're a core company, they're you know very open to to you know they're very proud of the roots and stuff. So, you know, I think just picking up the phone is probably is the best way. We get approaches all the time on different things. Some of them come to nothing. Some of them come to something. You know, but at least uh, uh, if if you have the conversation with Chet, absolutely. So when you say digital strategy, can it typically working off of a roadmap, or is it kind of Reactionary, or is it kind of working no, with stakeholders no, on a roadmap? Yeah, no, there is a roadmap there, absolutely, but it has to be flexible. Like, you know, um, I would have heard challenges a few times, you know, so where's the five year plan? You know, I have no idea what's going to be happening in five years' time, you know, because, and I don't think any of us here do unless someone has invented a time machine. But, you know, so I think an 18 month plan is, is logically as much as you can really kind of put in place. And that, that's what we would be working off is kind of an 18, an 18 month solid plan, and then maybe a three year kind of more slightly visionary, slightly more, we think we'll do this. That would be kind of the way we generally work. Yeah. Very good. Thanks.